thank you everybody for coming up today. Um, my name is Matthew Rolls. I did, um, I'm currently looking after the diffraction instrumentation at Curtin University. Um, and I came back to Curtin after quite a while, did my PhD there, uh, a couple of postdocs at CSIRO in Melbourne, um, which is what I'm talking about here, and then via some sales jobs and some other professional employment back to Curtin. And now I'm um, looking after things there for the last couple of years. And I thought I'd talk to you guys today about some of the work I did at the CSIRO with uh, energy dispersive diffraction and electrochemical cells. Um, so this is the work I did in, in one of my postdocs at the CSIRO. Um, and the work here is part of a cast of thousands. Um, it started off with Nikki Scarlett. She had the idea of doing all this stuff and got the ball rolling. And then I came along with uh, in my postdoc and, 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 and helped along with that. Uh, Mark Stiles was a PhD student that we had with us, um, did a lot of work with the, the first development. Um, Ian Madsen, Kath McGregor, Graham Snook, Andrew and Marshall, all on the electrochemical side and the diffraction side. And then uh, Daniel Riley, who was our um, Mark supervisor and uh, other people being my scientists, Dave Taylor, Tony Bell at, at Darsbury, uh, Thomas and Christina at, at Diamond, and John Evans and Alan Quayler helped us with the um, ED analysis. So the things that we were doing, um, we we're looking at um, you know, anodes for titanium electrowinning. So currently we make titanium by the Kroll process, which is kind of um, complicated as a batch process. Um, very labor intensive. Um, so we try to move to a more electro winning process, which is how they make aluminium and, and, and metals like that. So currently we use carbon anodes, but they get consumed during use. They contaminate the titanium, they complicate the process control. So the idea is to use inner anodes um, so that they, they, they don't react with the melt. Ideally they're metal oxides, they aren't consumed, they only evolve oxygen from the melt, from the anode. Um, and so we have our um, oxygen being produced from, from the anode and titanium being produced from the cathode. That's the plan. So we do get scale formation on the inert anodes. They aren't completely inert. They, the anodes are a, little, are a little bit inert. And so the anode materials do react with electrolyte and they form scale. So generally scale is good until it becomes bad. So it needs to be thin enough to let things through and still be electric conductive, but thick enough to be protective. So to look at these uh, inner anodes, what we need to do is we need to extract the anode from the, um, the electrochemical cell. We need to, well, without breaking it, we need to wash it off, get off all the calcium chloride, which is our, our molten salt to help do the uh, conducting, section the anode, polish it, mount it, look at it for XRD, SCM, the problem is with all this um, sample preparation is that we can actually then start uh, changing the system. We have additional reactions that happen in, in air. Um, any friable layers will, will, will flake off. Any soluble layers will start dissolving. And generally, we can change what's going on. So the idea is to do um, in situ and offer rando analysis. So we collect data during the actual electrochemical experiment to try and avoid artifacts. Um, that, that, that can be introduced and we try and replicate the industrial preparation, the, the processing conditions, which is always difficult, um, especially trying to get big things to happen in, in small containers. Um, temperatures and pressures are kind of easy, atmosphere is not too bad, but scale is, is, is hard. And then because we're watching the reaction in real time, we can see any intermediate phases, uh, which may have some bearing on the reaction mechanism. And, but it's very hard to do um, in lots of cases. And so if you don't, if you can get away with it, don't do it. But in this case, we had to undo it. So we wanted to look at formation on our anodes during electrochemistry. So we required quite a very uh, penetrating radiation to view inside the electrochemical cell. Um, we had you know, millimeters of alumina, centimeters of calcium chloride, um, and the actual furnace to go through. So you can do it with neutrons. Um, you can do it with uh, high energy X-rays, be it monochromatic or white beam. Um, we're also working at high temperature, 
150 degrees Celsius with calcium chloride. It's a difficult environment to work in. It's a very corrosive environment to work in. And generally, you can only really monitor the results at the, at the uh, electrodes. So for this work, we're looking at model anodes because the electrochemists know how they work. These are uh, the Magnelli phases. It's a substoichiometric titanium oxide, so TINO2N minus one. And in our case, the titanium was there in, in between four and six. And so why do we want to use energy dispersive diffraction? Um, traditionally with uh, angle dispersive diffraction, in order to look at the different despacings uh, in our material, we have uh, a one wavelength coming in and we change our angle to look at all the despaces. The problem with that um, setup for our material is that we wanted to look at a certain little bit of the anode inside a huge reaction vessel. And so to isolate that, we needed to go to a place where we could have uh, a single beam coming in, a single beam going out. So we go to energy dispersive uh, x-rays where we have uh, all of the energies coming in, so all of the wavelengths, um, and then just have one angle. So we, we can isolate beam coming in with the, with the pinholes to have a nice beam coming in. We isolate the detector by having a couple of pinholes to collimate the detector, and where the intersect is our active volume, and we can move our sample around to put the anode or other, other parts of interest into this lozenge here, and then look at diffraction only from that. So the first experiment we did was at uh, the Teddy Beam line, station 16.4 at Darsbury. Uh, this is the one that, that Nikki did. Uh, I came along for the ride. We were using X-rays between 20 and 100 keV. Um, this beam line here had three different detectors. Um, this wasn't an in situ or was an in situ experiment, but not an operando experiment. The cells were cold. Uh, we ran them at in the lab in, in Melbourne. Uh, turn them off after running them for you know, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours to progress the experiment along. Froze them, put them up in epoxy so they wouldn't react and took them across there to see if we could see anything. So this is what it looks like inside. Look down the top of the, the, the crucible, we can see this is the, the, the anode, manila phase anodes. That's the wire for the cathodes that goes down from the side. The cathodes that's in the bottom here, anodes here. So basically we're shooting x-rays sort of blind through a crucible, trying to hit this anode and see if we can see anything going on inside. So basically what we can do, is we can shoot our um, x-rays through. Here's our active volume where the detector's looking here, beams coming in. And as we truck our sample across in the active volume, when we nip the end of the anode here, we start seeing rutile peaks, which is titanium dioxide. The, the fully oxidized titanium. As you keep going, we start seeing the manili phases come in as the, the, the unreacted core comes through. As we keep going, we have more manili phase and less rutile. And if we see the rutile thicknesses, this is the diffraction patterns here, start seeing where the rutile appears, start seeing where the manili phase appears. And this distance here, in the case 0.6 or, or 0.7, 1.6, distance gets bigger as the reaction time goes along. We can start to estimate uh, how the, the, the reaction progresses with time. What we can do is uh, we can shoot the X-ray beam just above the top of the calcium chloride. This is a good idea from the point of view of the diffraction experiment because the calcium chloride is very absorbing. Um, and not very many x-rays actually get out of the sample once we go going through calcium chloride. So we skim this to surface. We can see here a big difference here between the start of the rutile. This is this rutile pattern here and the start of the Manili phases, about 0.6 millimeters. If we scooch the sample up a couple of millimeters, just go through the, the, the bulk of the calcium chloride, we can still see this difference here from the, the start of the rutile to the start of Manili phases. Um, which basically means that what we're doing here at off the top is not a, not a bad thing, the reaction still happens. And looking at the analysis of the materials, we're looking at a whole pattern analysis with Rietveldts, we're doing full structure analysis um, in, in Topaz, so we're not doing individual peaks or poly analysis, it's a, it's a Rietveldt with crystal structures, and we're doing simultaneous refinement on the multiple detectors. Um, with all the, the fun that the energy dispersive data has with the, the poor resolution, the lots of peak overlap because we've got triclinic phases there. 
and having to model all the relative intensities. So with the, the modeling, we model uh, an incident beam coming in with this sort of energy curve. We have worry about absorption. They come together to give some sort of beam that comes out of the sample. We fed that into, toto, into Topaz and with the help of Alan Quayle and John Evans and Nikki and Ian, we can do quantitative analysis. So this is looking at the quant of the, the rutile phase and the, the two Magnili phases, TI5 and TI6, as we go across the, 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 the face of, the, of the, the anode. We start off with lots of rutile on the outside, and then in the middle, we're going through the bulk, and then as we go to the outside here, more rutile, where it's just the unreacted, the fully reacted uh, rutile on the outside. So we can do quant across the whole thing, assume some, some densities, get some calculated thicknesses, um, and we can see that as we go up, we get more, as we react for longer, we get uh, thicker material. So how do you know that's correct? Um, this is basically where I came in with my postdoc um, after pressing some buttons on the stuff. We did optical microscopy. So after we've done the measurements at the Darsbury, bring them back to Melbourne, cut them up, polish them, have a look in the microscope, in this case, optical microscopy, we can measure them and we get about the same thicknesses. We can do some X-ray mapping experiments where we have a, a small beam going over the surface and seeing where the phases appear and disappear. So here we can see the rutile phases on the outside, manually phases in the middle. We can measure these distances here. We can just do some normal diffraction over the whole thing, do some calculations on, on the, the root metal disk and plot them all together. And they all kind of line up. So we reckon that the answer is all the same. So we're pretty sure that it works. So now that we're happy that the, uh, the experiment can actually, or the analysis can work, and that we're seeing what we think is going on is true, then the, it, we apply to here and do an operander experiment. So we wrote a proposal and got some time on Jeep, we've got five days um, to go over there and do some, um, some measurements there. They've got a 23 element, or at least at that time, they had a 23 element, element detector array fixed at five degrees. So the Darsby experiment had one detector, at, sorry, three detectors at different angles. This one's got 23 detectors at one angle. So we're doing uh, diffraction measurements on operational cells. So we've got molten, molten calcium chloride at 950. Uh, we're doing electrochemical experiments and we're collecting data at um, in one minute slices over seven or eight hours. We've got five different samples happening and we're monitoring electrochemical results at the same time. So the beam line, um, this is what the beam line looks like in here. This is rather large through here. This is five or 10 meters across this way. Here's our detector. Um, out of all the 23 detectors here, we just used the top one because that's what was all we needed to do. Um, Mark Stiles uh, was our PhD student on this and, and he made our furnace and everything that was all out for that for us. So this is our institute cell here. So this is the, the anode. The anode goes into a, a bunch of aluminum shielding because the calcium chloride is, is uh, quite corrosive um, into our, our top jacket here and feeds into our crucible down here. All this is set up nicely so that when we put the, the stalk in, the, the anode goes to the same spot within about half a millimeter every single time. So that when we're, when we're changing anodes, we don't need to realign, realign everything. It all goes back to where we start. We can put our beam straight in here. It'll go in here plug in electrochemical stuff at the top. We can do electrochemistry, we can do diffraction, the whole thing should work. And it did. The furnace is a two zone furnace. So we can heat it up the top zone and the bottom zone to melt the calcium chloride in the first place and then just turn off the top one and keep it melting down the bottom here. We've got a couple of ports going in and out. X-rays come in, X-rays go out and out to our detector. We've got cooling water all on the frame. And so we can position the frame to within, you know, a micron of its life, and it stays where it's going to be going. So on the beam line, that's what it looks like. Uh, X-rays come um, out of the synchrotron through here, through the slits into our detector, and we can feed in our uh, anode through the top here, um, and then do our experiments. So this is what our sample looks like. Uh, this is a... Um, our cathode gets reduced from to titanium metal and our anode which gets oxidized to, to rutile and this is about the same right sort of dimensions of what's going on we've got about a five millimeter by about three millimeter 
uh, anode and the, the active volume is about 15 millimetres big. And then after the reaction, it looks like this. The calcium chloride has managed to wick its way up and start eating away at our alumina and all sorts of fun stuff inside. So the data we get out at the end looks like this. Uh, we have uh, diffraction data in, in here, this case here shown in Q from low energy to high energy and going increasing with, with time. So our rutile phase increases, um, our nearly phases go down and our lead fluorescence stays the same. <laughs> Um, that was just above the calcium melt. Do I go backwards? So shooting the beam just above the calcium chloride uh, melt surface, we can see nicely. If we go down five millimeters and go through the calcium chloride melt, all of the low energy peaks go away. That's absorbed in the calcium chloride, it can't get out. And we're only left with the high energy peaks and the lead fluorescence from the detector shielding. So the big thing that I brought into this analysis was the, uh, the, the um, data analysis from a Rietveld scale. We generalized the thing completely. So we, we independently, separately looked at the incident intensity distribution, the sample and, sample and environment absorption, any fluorescence, the spe specimen broadening, how the detector responds to the, to the incident x-rays, escape peaks from the detector, which uh, confused me for quite a while until I figured out what they were corrections, polarization corrections, all put into the model so we can also independently do them for any sort of instrument that we came across. And so once you do that, <coughs> once you do that, you can get this sort of stuff coming out here. So in here, this is our calculated pattern for rutile inside a model pattern of, of rutile with, with two Manili phases. And just by changing one button in the, in the model from uh, calcium chloride length of about five millimeters. <coughs> a calcium chloride length of about five millimeters to a calcium chloride length of about 50 millimeters. We can, uh, in the model, set up the extra absorption to then correctly model what's going on with the rutile phase in this instance here. So from all of that, we can pull out things like our phase evolution, um, see it how the the rutile goes up and how the manili phases go down. Looking at the data above the melt, we get this nice curve here. Looking at the data below the melt, we get essentially the same answer. So what we're looking at above the melt and below the melt is giving us this, the, the, the same numbers. So we like, we like that because looking at the good data above, um, but then benchmarking against the data from below. With electrochemistry, electrochemists were quite happy with this stuff here because we're putting in a, a, a constant current density. We can map the, the voltage and, and, and resistance of the whole cell. And then we, we, we correlate that with what's happening with the rutile. So as the reaction progresses, we can see steps as we go through the, the different uh, reduction schemes of the, the oxidation schemes of, of the, the anode. And then watching the rutile go up, the rutile starts to shoot off quite a bit high when the resistance of the cell starts going through the roof. So the electric chemists were happy with what, what we were seeing and then we were happy from a diffraction point of view because it all married up. With the kinetics, we can then look at what shape is the curve and then we can figure out that what we're looking at is actually one dimensional diffusion. So in the, in the length scales that we're looking at, all that we need to worry about is the oxygen going through the, the scale layer on the outside of, of the, the anodes. There's, there's no nucleation going on, it's just oxygen going into the system. So this is a, a nice uh, square root curve. And the rate constants above and below are essentially the same number. The uh, induction time for the uh, below the melt is shorter because when you're above the melt, you need some time for the calcium chloride to start wicking up the outside of the, the anodes to start the reaction going on. And then from here, we can look at layer thicknesses. So if we assume that we have 100% dense, we can then calculate how thick the layers are from the quantitative phase analysis. And then 
looking at the thickness of the layers from above and below. We can also look at other experiments we did. So we did one experiment at half the current density that we normally run at. And so we can see that even when we run at half the current density, we're still getting the same layer thickness has come out. So the anode degra degradation is not limited by current growth or by the current density, at least in the range of, of 50%. It's limited by the, the solid state diffusion of oxygen going through the, the, the root hole on the outside of the anode. So from all this stuff that we found, we found that basically all the, the hard x-ray techniques offer the, the possibilities of doing the, the structural changes in situ. We can see what's going on. We can see the, the conversion of the Manili phases to the Rutol. We can analyze the ED data quantitatively. We can do a rebuilt refinement and get structure information out. We can separately model the influence of the, the sample and the instrument on the diffraction patterns. So we can, we can either change the sample, keep the instrument the same or other way around. We can extract out layer thicknesses, get out reaction kinetics, compare answers between different parts of the, the experiment, different setups to then pull out numbers on how the reaction is going on. We have similarities between above the, the melt and below the melt, so we can get meaningful data without the effects of absorption that we can trust if we go just above the melt. Um, by separating out the, the sample and the instrument effects in the analysis model, now the, the model is generally applicable to any sort of energy dispersive uh, experiment. And the good thing with the, um, the furnace design that, that Mark put together was that the furnace and the cell is generally applicable for any sort of um, molten salt experiment or high temperature experiment. We want to stick things in the same spot and have them not move anywhere at all. That's all I have to say on, on, on this thing. Um, it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind tour through what I did for a, a three, two or three years. Um, and thank you for all of your attention.